I'd like to begin from the, from the fine model we had of the previous session. Um, you have information on the panelists in your packet, and so I won't do um, elaborate introductions, but I thought what I would do is to, f is to reframe our, our focus uh, a bit. We're talking about the future here. We're talking about a particular kind of future, 50 years hence, beyond the kind of data sets that we'll find very reliable. And the point I want to make here, before I talk about economics as an approach to understanding the future, is think about what I read in today's New York Times and those incredible photographs one sees. Imagine if you're a model of the airline industry economies of the world. And no one told you, by the way, on the 16th of April, 2010, there is going to be this obscure, extremely long, unpronounceable name of a volcano in Iceland that's going to shut down every major Europe, European hub and then figure out what's going to happen to the economies of air travel, to prices, to availability, to all of those things we can only imagine. So we're in an exercise here of imagination. And I'm going to push the panel to be, and, and you to be thinking of that, and you to help us in this, this enterprise. Because we have, not, all, not only do we have disciplines that want to look at the future, look at Africa in terms of data sets. And I thought Nathan Eagle was fantastic, so I'm, this is not picking on uh, data set people. But the predictive ability of, of certain kinds of, of information is important. Economics as a discipline relies on that more than history, for example. But let's imagine that those data sets are thrown into disarray by what environmental historians increasingly call the catastrophic explanation. That we're not looking just at long-term temperatures, long-term uh, precipitation distribution across the globe. We're talking about major events, earthquakes, volcanoes that change the atmosphere. No one can predict the kind of geological catastrophe. And we don't know whether that's going to stop on Saturday. British Airways tells us they're going to fly us from Heathrow on Saturday. They don't know that. I don't think their geologists are especially well trained or well uh, informed. So we have this unpredictable issue of 50 years hence, and the process get, of getting us from here to there. We can all try to make the best estimates, the best kind of conjectures we can. And what I find especially interesting about this panel is not only their distinguished credentials to come and join us today, but they represent different aspects of economics. And so if we think of economics as a discipline that does like modeling, we have to say the models are not going to get us that far. We really want our four panelists and you to think about imagination. Let's jump ahead a little bit. The, the, the mobile phone discussion is fantastic. It really tells us we have to assume what's under the radar, so to speak, of things going on in Africa, where Africa is a leading edge of those, those issues. So we have represented with, with us, as you'll see in your description, if I describe people not by their names here, but by their focus on economic um, activities, marketing entrepreneurship, international trade, political economy, and agricultural economics. These are all perspectives on what data you're interested in, what data you, you're interested in, in managing, and then predicting from, because economics is, a, is it is historical, but it makes its way and makes its reputation and gets more money than the rest of us by its claim to predictive capacity. So what I'd like to do is to have our, our colleagues here put on our, the table with their, their presentations, and rather than taking questions at the end of each, we'll come back and do the same kind of uh, round the room and put issues on the table for us to, to discuss. But again, I want to emphasize, I'd like us to be thinking about how do we look into that 2060, um, if it's a metaphor or it's an analogy. We want to under, think about Africa in the future and begin to build a sense of how Africa does, in fact, give us good news and distinctive news, even when some of it's, we don't quite know what the, what the outcome will be. So let us go according to, according to, the, to the program. And I, is that the order they're sitting here? I believe so. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I say anything, let's give a big hand to Adele and his uh, entire team. They did a great job. <laughs> Although I wish they had done a little bit better for the weather, but uh, we'll forgive him for that. I come from Austin, Texas, so what can I say? The, 
my comments here are based on my two previous books, uh, both published by the Wharton School Publishing. One is called 86% Solution, and second one is called Africa Rising. Uh, has anybody read any of these books? <laughs> Adele? Adele, you haven't read the book. <laughs> yeah, you have read the book? <laughs> anybody else has read Africa Rising? No, so you better go and buy one. Julius, uh, you have read the book? Yes. Come on, come on here. Yes. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Julius from Kenya. Very excited to be here. Okay. Julius, what the hell did you read in my book? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I read that there's entrepreneurship going on in Africa. There are people overcoming huge obstacles and making money in Africa. And there is good business and good profits to be made. That's what, that's what I read in the book. And there, you capture this energy that you talked about there going on and things are happening. And Africa is actually rising from and being driven by entrepreneurs. Wow. That, that's, that's, you give me a hand, please. <laughs> Does he get a million dollars? And this young lady here. <laughs> Tell us your name. My name is Heran. Uh, what did I read in the book? I also was very energized by the book. I uh, got a lot of optimism from it. I uh, um, got excited about the possibilities of things to do. Um, and I've spent the last four years in Ethiopia, so some of these things I could actually see. Uh, I could make connection with what I've seen. So I was extremely invigorated by it, by the book. Wow, I love this girl. <laughs> Give her a hand, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a marketing guy. I'm not an economist. I'm a son of a businessman. Uh, I come from a state where it's nothing but conflict, uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur, uh, dropped out from college. My mother was, had an education up to the eighth grade, and people thought that nobody would get married to her because she was too educated. She could spell her name. She could count. And poor my father, they were so much in love that they had 11 children. <laughs> and I'm number eight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, government do not create jobs. Politics does not create jobs. Who creates jobs? Who creates jobs? Entrepreneurs. My father was one of them. I grew up listening from him the stories that he was a small businessman, self-made. When he started his small business, he didn't know what he was going to do, got lucky, got into the business of wholesale textile, and he would go to the various parts of India, buy the fabrics wholesale, then on the donkeys and the bicycles, he would go to the rest of the state. He would send his people to go and sell those. I'm the first generation to get education. I grew up by hearing from him that when he used to go to Bombay or Kanpur, there used to be signs that Indians and dogs are not permitted. And he came back home, he said, son, you need to move on. One day, we'll get these Britishers out. It may take us 20 years, it may take us 30 years, but we'll put our act together. Ladies and gentlemen, it took India 45 years to put this act together. Africa is not any far. Future is not, 2060 is not going to be built on what the hell the Britishers did, the Portuguese did, the Germans did. They're so scared of us. Why? Because so many of us. So many of us. And that's the six points that I'm going to make within my next 15 minutes. My first book was 86% Solution. By the way, how many of you are here from Africa? Raise your hands. Uh, how many of you have never traveled to Africa? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are doing academic research on Africa? Raise your hands. Okay, I'm in good company. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, the fact of the matter there is that since you, when you, when you look at since 1948, that's when many of the things start happening uh, in this world. Uh, the, India got its freedom, uh, Pakistan was established, many countries got freedom 10, 15 years after that. Uh, the Indians even helped Kenyans to get freedom, Ghana, you name it. I mean, there was in the next 20 years, from 48 to 68, many, many good things happened on this planet. That's not interesting. 
I started asking question about 12, 13 years ago, and I'm not an economist. I do not do research on developing countries. Until five years ago, I knew nothing about Africa. I'm a hardcore mathematical modeler. And that's, when I, that's where I had made my academic reputation. Anyway, I got interested. I said, let me ask this question. Since 1948, other than Japan, how many countries have managed to become a developed nation? And the developed nation definition is when the country attains a GDP per capita of 10,000 US dollars. And if somebody makes 10,000 US dollars in this country, we call that a person a poor. Not interesting. When I started looking at the data, I discovered hardly 15 or 20 countries since 1948 has managed to attain a GDP per capita of 10,000 US dollars. Israel, GCC countries, Brunei, Ireland. Ladies and gentlemen, since 1948, less than 150 or 120 million people have managed to become part of a developed nation. In my lifetime, and I'm an old man, I'm not going to see any country become a developed nation. Be that be Africa, be that be China, be that be India. GDP per capita of India, $1,000. You go and take any, any single digit growth rate, India is not gonna become a developed nation, neither is China. Not interesting. Question now there is, what is the relationship between the developed world and developing country, and Africa is very important in that context. Chinese don't scare me, by the way. With a GDP per capita of $2,000 or $3,000, take any single digit growth number, assuming that population doesn't grow, assuming nothing happens there, they are not gonna become a developed country. They don't scare me. They're entrepreneurs. They make me more competitive, really more competitive. And I have seen that in Africa. With 750 million people in China who do not have access to a toilet, I don't get scared. With 750, 700 million people in India who do not have access to a toilet, I don't get scared. India is the only country on this planet that have a toilet museum. <laughs> Go see it. It's beautiful. My God, it is beautiful. They don't scare me. I get scared by their entrepreneurship. Who's gonna be entrepreneurs? Ladies and gentlemen, fact of the matter there is, only 14% of the world population lives in the countries where the GDP per capita is more than $10,000. And 300 million of us in this country command one third of the world economy. This is how smart we are. And this country was not built by the government, this country was built by the entrepreneurs. Every decade, there was one Michael Dell. There was one Carnegie. There was one Mellon, there was one Bill Gates. They pushed the economy, ladies and gentlemen, they created the job. Michael Dell's one single company pushed the economy of the state of Texas. Despite the government, Democrats, Republicans, he moves on. Now when you look at this 14% of the world, the mess that we are in, and there is an 86% block sitting there, the major block being India and China and Africa, and I'll come to that in a moment. Where the hell do you think this 14% of the world is going to go to do trade? Who would like to invest in a company which is growing at 2% a year? Because most of these companies like to have their, their growth rate at least three to four times more than the GNP growth rate. And that growth rate, ladies and gentlemen, is going to happen in the emerging markets, India and China being the biggest excitement, and don't ignore Africa. How many people live in Africa? Raise your hands. Yes, ma'am. How many? Yes, sir. How many? <laughs> Translation gap. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are more than 950 million people who live in China. The, if the Africa the United States of Africa, the population will be comparable to India and China. Not interesting. How many of you know that if Africa the United States of Africa, its total economy is bigger than India? Raise your hands if you knew that. <laughs> One. How many of you know that GDP per capita of Africa is bigger than India? 
How many of you know that there are at least 16 countries in Africa where the GDP per capita is more than China? Raise your hands. One. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, you want to you wanna talk about Africa, and you don't even know that its economy is bigger than India. You don't even know there are 17 countries that the GDP per capita is more than China. Not interesting. <laughs> yeah. Five years ago, when I started this journey, I was trying to convince my, my students were trying to convince me because I teach a course on invisible global market. He said, Professor, how come in your book, 86% solution, you have not talked about Africa? I had not. Because I thought, uh, thought that Africa was a charity case. I mean, the CNN news has brainwashed the hell out of me. <laughs> New York Times had brainwashed the hell out of me. And then African diaspora. African diaspora, shame on them. <laughs> Every time we have a panel at the University of Texas, they did nothing but complain. Just like the Indians used to do 15 years ago. Indians don't do that anymore. They want to talk about Infosys. They want to talk about how many billionaires are there in India. They don't talk about the nonsense they used to talk with me about 15 years ago, and shame on African diaspora. Mm -hmm. Number of the immigrants in this country from Africa is exactly equal to the number of the immigrants from India. Did you know that? Say yes or no? No. Shame on you. <laughs> and this is a conference on Africa? <laughs> Did you know? that these people send $40 billion to the formal and informal economy, uh, the channels, to back, to, uh, back to Africa, exactly equal to the amount that the Indians send back home. Did you know that? Yes, I think Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> See? My kind of a lady there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, somebody said, Dara, collect your data. Go read my book. <laughs> Not interesting. So from the marketing point of view, keep in mind the end of the day is the economies are going to be developed by the entrepreneurs and the economies are going to be developed by the consumers and the multinational no dumb. They like to see where they can make bucks. And let's not kid about that. Because if they don't make money, none of us will be sitting here. Who gave you money for your center? The party guy make a lot of money and thank God he's paying for our coffee and tea this morning. Exactly, and even my airline ticket. Is that correct? I hope you're paying for my airline ticket. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how that goes. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let, let, me, gentlemen, let me tell you, I traveled through the continent for three and a half years. At my old age, I cannot play golf because I had a lot of back issues. I love to travel to the developing countries. I love to tell the stories, and I got in the habit of telling the stories of the people that nobody listened to. I went, I talked to many advertising agencies. I talked to many, many companies, multinationals. Also keep in mind, you need role models. Young people look for role models. You would not believe how much Michael Dell and Bill Gates has done to this country in the Stanford area. Thank God for Mo Abraham. We were talking about why in East Africa. But let me tell you what I learned. The first thing that I learned there is that in Africa, just like every country, they divide the population into A, B, C, D, E category. Okay, so A will be the elite. These are the people who have sent their children to the United States to get education, and they come here and they badmouth the hell out of Africa. That's A. Then you have B. C are the hardest working people, like my father. These are the, your school teachers. These are your civil servants. These are the people in hospitality industry. Did you know that 25 million people go to Africa on tourism? Yes or no? You did. As compared to 5 million to India. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot have 25 million people come to Africa unless you have a damn good hospitality industry. So it's not a coincidence that Kenya even have colleges to train people how to work in the hospitality industry. Ladies and gentlemen, hospitality industry, you go to even either the, the West Africa, and we all go there to do research and we stay in five stars hotel. And we want a car to pick us up at the airport, and then we come here and we say, Africa is so bad. Africa is so bad. I'm vegetarian. Every place that I went, I found an Indian restaurant. I said, thank God for the Indians. 
I could eat. And thank God for the Africans, they like Indian food. Not interesting. <laughs> Let's talk about the, how the, these economies are built. Ladies and gentlemen, when I look at this data for A, B, C, D category, A and B category, I have, uh, classified them as Africa 1, C was Africa 2, and D and E was Africa 3. To me, the most interesting was Africa C, people like small businesses like my father, or my uncles who were civil servants. Guess what? Percentage of Africa C, and this is not my data. These are the multinationals who are telling me, these are the local entrepreneurs who are telling me, these are the advertising agencies who are telling me, the professor, this percentage, and this percentage varies from country to country, is anywhere from 30 to 50%. Some countries higher, some countries low. 30 to 50 percent. Ladies and gentlemen, there are 300 to 500 million people in Africa who would be classified as Africa too. And average size of the family is five, as compared to average size of family in India, four. Average size of a family in the United States, three. Average size of the family in China, three. When you take that number and you divide that 300 to 500 million people, you get 60 million to 100 million households who will be classified as Africa to in Africa. And by the way, that's exactly the number equal to the households in India. And that's the excitement about India. They say, my God, this middle class is driving it. And when you hear this phone, cell phone, guess who's buying those? These are the drivers. You can't get a job in the hospitality industry if you have a mobile phone. And guess what? Next time you throw your mobile phone, guess where it goes? Africa. They are the most brand conscious people that I have found. Yes or no? Yes. Adele, he's already standing. I'm going to quit. Maybe in the question and answer, I'll talk about it. Ladies and gentlemen, give Africa a break. Stop nonsense about complaining Africa. God bless you. I'm afraid I'm not going to be uh, nearly as entertaining as my <laughs> colleague here. Um, uh, let me just start by saying I've always been, I mean, always. Uh, since uh, I lived in uh, Mali uh, from 1981 to 1983 as a Peace Corps volunteer teaching math, I fell in love with Africa. And since then, I've worked in a number of African countries, and I lived in Tanzania for three years. And I've always been optimistic about Africa because I lived, I lived with the Africans who were the school teachers, the, you know, the the C category people, or the, and and I saw what great entrepreneurial spirit they had, and um, and how brave they were in the face of adversity, and um, so I'm glad that that fi finally um, some we are focusing on the good news out of Africa. Uh, let me just say also say. Um, Economists are notoriously bad at predicting the future, but we're very good at um, describing the past. So what I want to do now is I, I want to tell you about two recent papers from some very well-known economists that, are, that have great news about Africa. Then I want to talk to you about uh, three recent trends that uh, have been highlighted by a colleague of mine um, at Purdue University. And then I, I'll tell you, if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about a project I'm working on in Ghana. So um, forgive me, but some of this I'm going to just read to you. So um, there's a, a professor uh, named Xabier Salai Martin. Uh, he's written a paper. He's a professor at Columbia. Uh, I actually did my PhD at Columbia, and he's a crazy guy. He used to have office hours at midnight on Fridays, but he is very, he's a very well-respected um, um, growth economist. Um, he's just come out with a paper using data for the period 1970 to 2006, which shows that, first, African poverty is falling, and it's falling rapidly. Second, if present trends continue, the Poverty Millennium Development Goal of having the proportion of people with income less than $1 a day will be achieved on time. Three, the growth spurt that began in 1995 decreased African income inequality instead of increasing it. And fourth, African poverty reduction is remarkably general. It cannot be explained by a large country or even by a single set of countries possessing some beneficial geographical or historical characteristic. All classes of countries, 
including those with disad disad disadvantageous geography and history experience reductions in poverty. This again is for the period 1970 to 2006. Again, this seems to be very good news about what's going on in Africa. Now, <laughs> it's funny, I know both of these people. Um, and the second, the second paper is by a guy named Alwyn Young. You, some of you probably remember him from when he was a professor at Boston University. I can tell you a funny story about him, too. When I was um, on the job market, um, he had the nerve of calling me at 9.30, 9.30 p.m. on a Friday evening to quiz me about my job market paper. And anyway, he's an odd guy, but he, he's also um, using a completely different data set. He's, 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 he's almost a genius, I would say. He's an extremely bright guy. He's a professor at the University of Chicago, and um, he used to be a professor at Boston University. And he's written a new paper, it just came out in the past couple of months, using a completely different data set. So the first paper used data set from um, national income accounts, household survey, and, and household surveys. And the household surveys are used to c compute poverty by country and income distribution by country. The second paper by Alwyn Young uses data from the demographic and health surveys, which um, probably many of you know these data sets. Um, they're I, th I think they're probably the, the most well-respected, comprehensive national data sets that exist. Uh, and and um, one thing that's nice about them is that the methodology that they use to collect data is consistent across countries. So what Alwyn Young finds using these data is the following. Measures of real consumption based upon the ownership of durable goods, the quality of housing, the health and mortality of children, the education of youth, and the allocation of female time in the household indicate that, and here's the punchline, sub-Saharan African living standards have, for the past two decades, been growing in excess of 3% per annum, i.e. more than three times the rate indicated in international data sets. I think that these results are really encouraging, and I think that um, some people are afraid of these papers because they feel like, Oh, oh dear, uh, if we have too much good news about Africa, all the foreign aid for Africa will dry up. But I think that's craziness. I think that um, t too, too much of the negativity about Africa has led to some p pessimism about Africa. So I think that having these new papers that say um, positive things about what's going on in Africa should be, it should be beneficial for Africa and for development in Africa in general. Okay, so. Um, some, some, of, some candidate explanations for why things, so these papers just document what's going on, but they don't really give us any insight into why things might be, be going better in Africa. Um, um, so, so another uh, friend and co-author of mine, Will Masters, who's a professor, uh, uh, who's currently a professor at Purdue, but who's coming to join us at Tufts this fall, um, wrote an op-ed piece for uh, the syndicated press that should be forthcoming um, in the next couple of months. And he points to three, three um, trends in agriculture, uh, sorry, three trends in Africa that, have, that bode well for African growth and African poverty reduction and African welfare in general. So one is um, agricultural policies. So the, the, the under the direction of Kim Anderson, the World Bank has put together a new data set on poli ag agricultural policies across countries over time. So between 1995 and 2005, for example, how much, um, how much have governments been taxing agriculture? It's a, it's a, I, it's a pretty well-known fact, although I should try your thing. How many people know that, um, a, how many people know that in a, a Rich countries subsidize agriculture and poor countries tax agriculture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, it's a pretty well-known fact. But the good, news, um, the good news out of the data set that they've put together and they just finished is that taxation of agriculture in Africa has decreased significantly. So there have been some casualties associated with you know, the structural adjustment policies. I, I don't deny that, but in general, it's good news because markets are more open uh, to trade. Um, 
so that's one positive trend in Africa. The second is, um, and this is, I think, really important and really interesting, and I bet a lot of you don't know this. Um, so there's a, a demographic transition going on in Africa now, um, and, and there's something unique about Africa and the timing of the introduction of various vaccines and, and um, medical innovations that coincided with, um, um, with uh, freedom in Africa that made, so, so let me just read this to you. African households obtained access to modern medicine much later and more suddenly than people in other regions. So th the result is that um, increases in child survival rates and population growth during the 1970s and 1980s were much greater in Africa than in other regions. So you had rural population growth that was far higher. I, and I, I don't have a graph, but I, I have a graph if you're interested. So the rural population growth in Africa was much higher and much faster in Africa than it was in other regions of the world. And part of the reason is, is because of the timing of the, of the medical innovations, the cities in Africa were smaller than, than cities in other parts of the world when these innovations were introduced. So the cities couldn't, so there, there weren't opportunities for people in rural areas to migrate to cities. Cities in Africa are growing faster than cities anywhere else in the world, but they're still relatively small to compared to other regions of the world. So the, the good news is that, is that rural, rural population growth rates are starting to trend downward, and Africa can take advantage of that. Um, and then the third um, turning point that he, he makes note of is that um, there have been, there's been some improvement in agricultural um, Finally, after decades of agricultural stagnation, there, there are signs that agricultural productivity in Africa is catching up. So all of these things um, are, are, are plausible explanations for why we, um, we've seen, we've seen why, why these, these guys are finding that growth in GDP per capita and, and poverty reduction in Africa are much greater than we had previously thought. Um, um, other candidate explanations for why Africa's growth has been increasing include um, high commodity prices, Chinese investment in Africa, and um, possibly cell phones. So, um, so I thought um, one of the things that, so I thought I would, so those are from other people, and then I thought I would just close by talking to you about a project that we've been working on in Ghana that um, I think is is really exciting and 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 holds out hope. Um, so so we've been working with a rural credit bank in Ghana called Mumwadu Rural Development Bank. It's the fifth largest bank in the country. It's huge and um, it's located in Osino in the Osino region of Ghana, which is um, like so north northwest of. Accra, but not, not too far from Accra, so maybe two, two three hours from Accra. And um, we approached the bank four years ago to talk to them about possibly doing some experiments with lending products. So, so the issue is this. The bank was designed to lend money to farmers. It's huge. It doesn't lend any money to farmers because they say farmers don't pay back. The only people who borrow from the bank are people whose salaries get deposited, the CP to see people, <laughs> the, the, the teachers, the civil service workers who get paychecks that get deposited in the bank. They borrow from the bank. The bank knows that they will pay back because the bank can just deduct money directly from their deposits. So the bank's been there, but it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So we talked to them about introducing some new products to get farmers interested in, um, you know, to, to get farmers involved with the formal bank because the way it works now they have SUSE collectors people deposit you know, people save money with um, with informal um, institutions and they actually make negative interest on their savings so um, so the first project we tried was um, an indemnified loan product so we said okay let's let's see um, we met with the farmers and one of the one of the reasons they cited for not borrowing from the bank was a fear that 
they might not be able to repay the loan. So if the price of their crops fell below a certain level, they may not be able to repay their loan. So um, we said, okay, well, let's try a product that, let's try an experiment where we offer some farmers a loan that says, okay, if the price of your crop falls below a certain level, you only have to pay back 50% of the loan. Uh, and then the rest of the people we offered the regular loan product to. So on the positive side, take up rate was 98%. So all of the farmers wanted to borrow money from the bank. On the negative side, there was no difference in repayment rates. 60% of the farmers didn't pay back the money. So, um, and according to my, according to my colleague, uh, Ed Kutswadi, who's from Ghana, it's, it's not that unusual because the farmers are used to getting handouts from the government. They think that Momwado, although it's, although it's a, a privately owned enterprise, they think the money's coming from the government. They don't feel obligated to repay the loans. So, um, so we said, okay, that's not, that's not working too well. That's gonna lose the bank a lot of money. And so we switched now uh, the, the emphasis to a savings product because as, as somebody mentioned, the, the trust between, between the farmers and the banks is, is, lo is low and it needs to, the social capital needs to be built up. And um, so now we've got, we've, um, great. So now we've got, um, we've introduced a savings product and the savings product is designed so that you have targets, so you label your savings account. So you say, for example, I want my account to be, I'm gonna save for education for my kids. I'm gonna save for education, for, I'm gonna save for investment in my business. Um, and then um, p people put money into the accounts and the money has to stay for a certain amount of, peer, a certain amount of time if they don't, um, invest in what they say they're gonna invest in, there's a penalty on the account. So we're just starting this, but the good news is after six months, farmers from all over Osino are depositing money in Mumadu Bank. So we're really excited about this, and I think that, um, you know, even without cell phones, we're, we're, starting, we're starting to help this bank get into the business that it uh, was originally designed to get into. It seems to me like we've moved from very large issues of, of sort of positive thinking to micro level good news. That's, uh, that's a nice movement in terms of scale. Julius? Political economy is now going to be our adopted perspective. Okay, I've, uh, <coughs> uh, Julius Katune, I'm with Padi Center and happy to be part of this uh, event and happy to see all of you here. I'm going to talk about. Uh, how we think of Africa future. Because uh, if you look over a period of time, people have always thought of where is Africa going? And I uh, would want to see how has perceptions of Africa changing, changed over time? Because how people think about something is uh, very much defines what decisions they make or how they, they invest and so on. So we want to, to understand how perceptions of Africa have changed and what does that mean for the future? So this is my... I first start with looking a bit far behind because Africa has always been thought very different from how we think about it now. Because if you look at uh, during Greek time, Homer, when Homer talks of Africa, he talks it in, a, in glowing terms. This is where the Battle of Troy was stopped because the gods were in Africa with the greater gods of Africa because that's where the gods went. That's where everything came from. Nice things. So they, they couldn't fight the Battle of Troy for some time until the gods came back. I don't know whether anybody has read that in the references. And the blameless Ethiopians, that's what they were called. Uh, then when you come to Roman times, we, we, we talk of something new always coming from Africa. That was Pliny the Elder. He, he mentioned that. Though more was, it, was, it more indicated their, their level of maybe of not knowing what Africa was. But it was a fascinating place all the same. So, so there was always something. When you come to the Middle Ages, when Europe was really... In, in its own dark ages, and Africa was in the age of en enlightenment then, we had Mali and, and so on. We had 
Europeans actually looking forward to Prester John from Ethiopia to come and save them as uh, the Muslims went after Europe and they were the gates. It was the Africans who were going to save it. And actually when the Ethiopia, when the Portuguese went to Ethiopia, they actually did want to go to, to Ethiopia to, to help the, the, the Christian brothers. And I think in 1500, some Ethiopians actually died in this. Some, some Portuguese soldiers died in Ethiopia, helping Ethiopia. So it was seen as a, in a very different way. It was a brotherhood. If you talk of Congo, when again the Portuguese went there, they found a whole kingdom, had even embassies. We even had a court exchange of embassies, and even one of the sons of the king became a, a bishop. So, it's, so the perception was a place we could do things. But as you come to, towards colonial period, the pre-colonial period, just before the dawn of colonialism, image changes. And then we have the heart of darkness. Uh, this image of this dark place where nothing good comes from starts being developed, obviously. It, it was to facilitate the colonial enterprise. So you had to create this place that there was nothing which you are going to build and civilize. And therefore, the image of Africa as we know it now, I'm saying I'm from Kenya, but really Kenya is a creation of, of the British, really. It was nothing like Kenya before. So Africa as it is right now, is a, is a product of, of, of the image that was created at that time of the heart of darkness, where you wanted to go to do civilize and educate people and, and have commerce. So, so when we, and this image actually does persist in the way Africa interacts with other people. That's how Africa is seen. That's why, Vijay, when, when we're talking about uh, how people see Africa, people think this dark place where nothing happens because that's the image that we have about Africa. And, and the whole idea is, how does, what does that mean? How do we envision futures? It, it is important to, to, to think how, how we go ahead. Okay, let's, let's move. So this is how Africa has performed uh, economically, and this is how the images has changed. So you can see from the 60s, we, the economy moves in terms of per capita. People start growing, and we see we have winds of change, and there's something good coming. Africa is developing. Then suddenly, Africa hits the oil crisis in the 73, and things start going down. Then we have start, and then the military comes in, and we, we, we start having now turbulence is hitting Africa. That's the future starts becoming not rosy anymore. Then we go to 80s, and where things really start becoming bad, because then you, ha you have the, the, the military dictatorships coming in, you have the oil crisis, there's a 79, another crisis, and things really go to hell. When by, by, by 80s, you have the proper crisis, and we, we start thinking of Africa as actually a place which is now over. And that's the image we create. And that's how we start thinking of Africa. Then recently we start seeing uh, spots of growth, and then we start changing our image. We start seeing our oh, Africa, Renaissance, and so on and so on. So it's a question of trying to explore how do people think about Africa. And, 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 and one of my, my points I want to bring out is that we tend to be informed by short-term events when we think of Africa. So when we try to think of Africa futures, is we see a few things today happening, and then we project that forward. Yet we, we, try, we don't put a lot of effort trying to understand the dynamics of Africa. What's happening underneath? What is driving Africa? Are we, what are we seeing? Are, is this the future or is this a just perturbation? Where, what is the trend that we see? What is the longer tra trend? So, so, okay, let's go. So I'll try to discuss this. When we, 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 talk, we talk of 60s, the, the major events was before then, we had the World War. And World War was, was very important for Africa, World War II, because for once, you had to take soldiers in Europe. You had Senegalese soldiers fighting in France to save France. France government was actually in Central Africa. Was it, it was stationed where? The, the, the Free French government was actually in, I think, it was either Central Africa or Congo Republic. The, the goal was sitting there. That's where he was. So suddenly, people realized these people are not invincible anymore. They actually need us to, to, help, to help them. <laughs> so that changed mindsets, and that's, that was very, very important. People realized, okay, these are colonial people, but maybe there's nothing great about them. Maybe they have guns and so on. <laughs> but we can fight, and, and, and that awakening, and then Europe obviously also got very weak. The, the colonial powers were very weakened after that. 
And so they had to, to realize that we can't, we can't continue this uh, colonialism anymore. And we had the independence come. And then we, we now talked of, started thinking of different. If you look at the writings at that time, now we are talking of the missionary and the witch doctor finding a common ground. That was like the two separate world. We, the missionary is the one bringing light. The witch doctor was the one, the African, where it was darkness. So, you, so the perception started changing. We started seeing Africa is a different place, and there was hope. And then, if you, if you look at the kind of projections we see at that time, in 1968, somebody tried to project Africa to 2000. Uh, Khan, Khan, I think Haman Khan is famous, if you ever look at future, Futurist work. Uh, he was at Rand, uh, where Paddy was also at school. Uh, and so if you look at uh, GDP, it was actually projected as uh, growing from about a uh, very small number, about $40, 40 billion, to about, uh, I think, another doubling to 40, from 20 about to about 40, you can't see it clearly there. But actually, the, the GDP actually did much better than that. It grew much more. And if you look at it from a, what you call a purchasing power parity, which is a different way of measuring GDP, the growth was even bigger. But in terms of uh, per capita, actually it went a bit down because the population actually grew much faster. So the, the, the picture they presented was still good. But in terms of share of the GDP, uh, Africa actually went down from about 2% GDP of the world to about uh, uh, half 1%. So the, the projections were almost quite accurate, uh, I would say, uh, but uh, they didn't take care of the purchasing power because purchasing power or, or the share of African economy actually went down. So much as we did well, the, economy, the world economy grew even better, much more. So we didn't ask stay of the same pace. So, so when, when you come to 70s, okay, go back. There's one, one slide back. In the 70s, that's when you start having problems because that's when we, we, we started having, it actually started about 1966, the first coup occurred in 1966. Nkrumah was, was overthrown. But in 70s, that's when things started going to hell. By 1973, we were talking of over 50% of governments in Africa had been overthrown by the military. But this was why, because the, post, the post-colonial government didn't really work. Much as we, we said that we had got independence, we, we had grafted something on top. We, we took the same structures that were, were there, were laid down by the British. We took constitutions that were basically either French or British and put them on. And we didn't care whether they respected our traditions or anything. So, and then there were, you, had, you had the elites, the new elites competing with the older elites, the colonial chiefs and so on. And all these tensions created, nothing was working. You, we had patrimonial systems which became quite corrupt. And over time, the military tried to give a solution, which I, couldn't work. So Africa had problems. And things started going bad. But even by then, when we talk of, by 78, Hughes, Barry Hughes at... Uh, it's actually at another Papadi Center in University of, of, of Denver. Uh, they did another focus in, in 78, trying to, again, looking. 2000 was supposed to be a, a very important year then. I think everything was being done to, to, to go to 2000. So there you see population again, GDP not quite accurate in terms of uh, actual values, but uh, not very good when you to look at uh, the purchasing power parity. And again, you can see the Africa GDP really in terms of share, it really fell down. We was projecting to, to go to about 2%, but actually it fell even further. So Africa was actually doing badly. But all this because of the crisis that came about in 70s and so on, really eroded the purchasing power of African currency. So that even if you could improve your GDP, what you could buy with it was much less. Okay. So in talk of 80s, again, crisis. Because these are these, these were mentioned as... as you get the, the oil shocks, then you get drought in 84. You, the, there was the famous famines of 84. Then you go to ask, what do we do? Africans start thinking of new ways. We had talked talk, talk of Lagos Plan of Action, where Africans were supposed to cooperate and work together. But again, this, this didn't work. So what we got was uh, the structural adjustment programs, which really almost, you can say, they 
they almost wiped out the government. They, 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 they reduced the government of Africa. Everything was cut, agriculture, uh, we, we cut things to, to health. Uh, governments were downsized and so on. Africa became really, really weak at that time. And that's when uh, and paternalism attitude became the, the way of dealing with Africa. These people who need help, these people who need to be. And you had all this uh, live aid and everything and so on. Okay. So by, by, by 1980s, in fact, we had a special issue on New Republic that actually pronounced Africa dead. They said Africa is dying. Actually, people thought Africa was gone. It's go never going to recover. You had genocide in Rwanda. You had Sierra Leone things were going wrong. You had Liberia going to the basket. Everything was going wrong. Uh, and so a state failure, Somalia actually collapsed. And then at this time, you start hearing the coming of anarchy. I think that, that was a famous article. I don't know who, who ever came across it. Robert Kaplan, yeah. describing a future of Africa of chaos, child soldiers. That was the picture of what you saw in Sierra Leone or Liberia was now seen as the future of Africa. And then we have disintegration. Monihan, I think, was a senator, I think. He died. Yeah. But he wrote a book. He, he died in a plane crash, I think. But uh, yes, they all died. <laughs> okay. Yes, but he said that Africa by was going to collapse into 150 states. That was his projection. But now we okay. Somalia collapsed to two states. Now we have Puntland and we have Somaliland. No, nobody has ever recognized Somaliland. Eritrea okay broke off. But what happened? W what is peculiar about all this breakup is that Somaliland was actually a former colony of British, isn't it? And the Puntland, which the, the, Somali, the Somali we call Somali, was a colony of the Italy. Ita, uh, Eritrea was a colony of Italy. So actually, what we see is a reversion to even the colonial boundaries that we say are so artificial. So they, maybe they are not as artificial as we think. Somehow people have internalized them. And when we break up, we only go to what was there. So again, so, so then we, we have the new, when things start happening again in the 80s, we, we start having a growth coming, uh, economies recover. 14 countries started, were, were identified as doing very well. So from there we have a renaissance. Mandela is released from prison, economies are growing and so on. So now the future again changes. Now Africa is on a renaissance, Africa is going to do well and so on and so on. And again, the projections showed uh, countries doing quite well. And again, if you look at them, they, they are quite good. O OECD did some projections, which were quite accurate, although for Cote d'Ivoire and, and Zimbabwe, obviously those countries, things, things went bad. So again, you, what, what I'm, we can move ahead. What I'm trying to do now, now right now, we, again, this now the projection that we start seeing, just, just, just one before. We are seeing Africa as now a place of business the last business frontier. That's, that's the image we are, we are having. And you can see all people coming. You can see Chinese coming in. You can see African multinationals attacking. You have Ethiopia. You have, you, have, you have Kenyan companies moving on. You have Libyan companies. You have all kinds of multinationals of Africa starting to capture the market Africa. From outside, we are seeing private equity firms. You are seeing Chinese firms. You are seeing India. And the other day, I think India, Biotel has bought Celtel for, I think, $12 billion. Uh, no, how many? But Zane, Zane, Zane has been bought for how much now? I think by $12 billion, isn't it? So Africa is being seen as a place of business. We also have World Cup coming in. So, OK, let's move. <laughs> and World Cup is actually a reflection that it's a market that has grown enough to support World Cup, because World Cup is really a marketing event. So if you have a World Cup in Africa, it shows that one market has matured well enough to host World Cup. Please go back to the previous slide. Yes, OK. Is that the Mahajan, the same Mahajan, Africa Rising? That is, yes. <laughs> Entrepreneurs will not have, uh, yeah, see Mahajan. OK. Good. That's that few. <laughs> For one, one, one useful statistic I got when I worked, sorry, I'm running out of time. One useful statistic I got when I was working at McKinsey in South Africa was that the market for diapers in South Africa no, in, in Nigeria, it's bigger than a market for diapers in Europe. Because Nigeria babies are being born. Babies are not being born in Europe. So Procter & Gamble is future. When you talk of buy diapers, you're not going to sell diapers in Eastern Europe. You're not going to sell diapers anymore in Europe. Diapers are being sold. In Africa, there is a market for baby diapers. 
That's okay. So this is again the same picture. Uh, that's what I was trying to talk about. We we tend to think of Africa in terms of very short term happenings, and how should we think of Africa? Paul Collier has said that Africa is like a game of snake and ladders. I don't know how many have ever played that game. You throw a dice, you climb a ladder, you throw, you get a snake, and you go down, and so on. And he said like and. That's how Africa is. Countries do well, then suddenly they go down, but then suddenly they may move up again. And my argument is that as long as you continue playing the game of snake and ladders, you finish the game. And the game is not over. We tend to think when Africa is swallowed by a snake, game over, they're over. But no, it's, it's continuing. And so we, 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 we better start paying more attention to the fundamentals of Africa. And the fundamentals of Africa is a, a growing population, so on. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for... Thank you, Julius. We now have, of course, a new measure of economic development around the world, presumably. Is it cloth or is it disposable? I think that's our other question about the diaper factor. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have our, our last presentation, and we'll move to, to questions, comments um, from the group. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is... Uh, uh, my name is Arunan Kazianga, and I'm a faculty at Oklahoma State University, but I'm originally from Burkina Faso. So I, 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 well, well, well I, I want to, uh, to talk about something specific, about financial market, but uh, financial market as we see it from a microeconomics perspective, as we see it from a farmer perspective. Um, a short ago, uh, um, uh, my colleague Margaret uh, um, Talk about credit, how it, it was, how, how well, well, how uh, farmers needed credit in Ghana, but they could not have access to it well until they started running this experiment. And in his presentation, um, just uh, just in the last presentation, okay, he mentioned uh, in the list of event about the drought uh, um, in '84 and '85. Okay, in some of the uh, in some of the African countries. So one of the question uh, and one aspect of financial market which is, being, um, uh, which is missing at least from the, um, from the prospect of, uh, um, of farmers, uh, poor household in Africa, is what do I do if I, lo um, uh, if I lost uh, um, um, uh, my income uh, due uh, from a, uh, a bad rainfall? Uh, due from a health shock. What do I do next? Okay, so uh, please, if you read um, from due to full view, it's going to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, full view. Okay, so, and <clears throat> so I'm going to review some, some, um, um, some facts here uh, as, well, 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 at least as, as they are accepted in the uh, in the development in the development economic uh, literature, and there is a nice summary by um, uh, by Cunning and Chris Udry in 2006. Okay, we start um, we talk about uh, about financial market um, in develop uh, in developing countries. Okay, so but the basic facts are um, are the following. Okay, uh, that first credit constraint is severe, and in most cases. Um, uh, the, um, the only credit which is available is informal credit, okay, and 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 that's still um, an informal credit be, um, uh, means here uh, when you go uh, to your friend, to your um, to your relatives for credit for borrowing, or when you go to the to the uh, to the money lender um, um, for f um, for credit. Um, there's some, um, some social arrangement. So uh, people live in the same villages or in the same communities and they have friends who moved into the cities to work. If I, face, um, if I am facing a certain loss of income, they could help me out, but the next time I could help them, I could help them out. But even that is not enough to cover okay, uh, um, the type of income loss when, where, uh, that people are usually confronted with. And, and the, the, the main consequence is that the lack of credit and, and, and the lack of insurance, okay, have, um, 
um, some, um, some really uh, big effect on, on production first, and even on human capital. Okay. So if I lose my income today because like what happened in um, um, uh, in 85 and in uh, and in, uh, 84 in some countries, okay. So if a farmer loses his income, okay, some of the options could be to take some of his children out of school, okay. So they and and that will interrupt the um, um, the education. So that one specific shock would not have an impact on, on, on the parents, but could have a cumulative uh, effect on the future generation. Just because of one shock, their education was interrupted. Okay. And of course, uh, we have all this issue with production. Okay. So even, actually, the, the main, uh, one of the, the facts about, uh, about farming in Africa is that on, 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 on some of the research institutions, we have, we have enough knowledge, enough technology to increase yield substantially. So the question is that why don't farmers adopt uh, this, with, um, this type of technology uh, uh, widely? And one of the explanations is that, okay, if um, in, <clears throat> in a rain-fed farming, okay, uh, you, you, you are required to make some upfront investment in time of input, in time of fertilizer, in time of pesticide, if you, um, if you adopt this type of technology. But, the, uh, but you don't know the outcome until the end of the season. So if you invest a lot in this type of input and it turns out that it's a bad rainfall season, then it, 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 um, it could be a big loss. Okay? And most farmers cannot afford uh, this type of loss. So for them, it could be even <clears throat> if the average yield is low, but because of the certainty associated with some of the old technology, it's better to stick with this type of technologies. Okay, next. So, um, wh while I review some, um, 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 some work here that, that I've done with, uh, um, with Chris Udry, looking at some of the, um, the data from Burkina Faso around this, um, um, this draft period, okay? And that we found is that the social, the social, the social arrangement was not enough to to um, to protect household uh, to protect household consumption. Okay, but most importantly, most of these households save in time of um, in term of livestock. And one of the theory before that was that okay, this this household have livestock, so if they lose their income, okay, they could sell their livestock and 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 smooth out their consumption. Okay, and. But what happened is that, okay, when uh, we observed that this household didn't sell their livestock, okay, and there are some reasons. Okay. Uh, first, it's prudence, because when, <clears throat> when the drought hit, you don't know for how long it's going to last. So if you sell all of your, uh, all your livestock at the beginning of a drought, you could be uh, in, um, uh, in a bad shape if the, um, um, if the drought uh, turned out to last. And the second thing is, uh, has to do um, with the livestock market, right? And the prices, uh, it's a draft, and everybody wants want to sell his livestock, so the price collapsed, and no one, and everybody loses income, so you don't have a market for your livestock anymore. And another thing was, was about indivisibilities. So if you need, um, you don't, um, with, uh, with livestock, okay, um, well, you cannot sell a half. Well, you cannot sell a fraction of an of 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 of, uh, of an, an an animal. You have to get rid of it. And 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 for some farmers, okay, the disinvestment rate was too high. They could not afford to sell uh, a full bull or the entire goat. What 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 they would have needed is a fraction of that income, but they could not afford that. Okay, and again, and livestock is a productive asset. Okay, so if you get rid of your livestock uh, um, during the drought, replenishing your herd will be uh, could be difficult. Okay, so you will lose, and 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 these farmers didn't uh, want to lose um, their productive asset. Okay, so uh, and in recent studies, uh, so and 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 what happened during that is that even if farmer was close to subsistence level, 
okay? They didn't want to sell their livestock. So they didn't have a saving or an insurance mechanism when uh, this drought hits them to protect, um, to protect their livelihood. Okay. And in the recent studies, I went to revisit some of this data, and what, what we found um, uh, is that it's not just um, because these households are being exposed to a specific shock today. It's because um, depending on the type of, of, uh, of, of income you have access to, which will depend on the type of land you have and the size of your land and the type, and, and the type of crop you can grow uh, on your land, your income could be more or less volatile. Okay? And what we find is that um, the, um, farmer who, has, who have uh, the most volatile income didn't want to take any risk in investing in their children's education to start with. Okay? And that will add another layer of cost of, of, uh, of, of the lack of insurance. Okay, uh, next. Okay, and um, this, is, this is the recent work where, where now we start seeing, okay, this is what, uh, what we've seen, but what can be done? Okay, so, and fortunately, sometimes it doesn't take, um, it doesn't take a lot, okay, just some, um, um, some small action, some uh, well-designed policy could change things. And this is one of uh, such policies, okay, um, that, that was experimented by the World Bank and um, the World Bank, the World Food Program, and, and the Ministry of Education in Burkina Faso, where they tried d different m modality of serving food, uh, um, uh, 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 school feeding uh, into some of these villages. And guess what? It works. Okay? So within one year, okay, uh, they were able not only to increase enrollment by 4% for girls, okay, this is just one year, but if you keep up, um, um, the effect will accumulate over time. But most importantly, okay, providing school feeding turned out to have a big impact on, 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 on children, on younger children who were, who were between um, 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 6 and 60 months. And talking about in terms of human capital, in terms of of of, uh, of of capital of uh, of capacity building, okay. It's well known that um, well, this is a critical window where where um, if a, uh, if a child is sick, he's yeah, um, uh, he's malnourished at that period of time. Okay, he might he, uh, you you might not be able to to uh, uh, to close the gap later on. Okay, please. Okay, and. And, well, and one more good news, which, which, which came from, from, um, from the previous work and talking to farmers on the ground, okay? So uh, I start talking to, to, um, to a farmer association. So uh, I, 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 grew up on, uh, I grew up on a farm. My parents were farmers, actually, so I, I get along with this guy when I go there. So, and, and I started talking to them, and the question um, um, was what? Okay, so um, they know that the, um, the production is risky, okay? They, um, they were made farmers, okay? And some of them know that based on the, um, based on talking to, um, to extension agent, they could increase their yields by three times, even more than that, if they use the fertilizers or, or if they use fertilizers and they use the, the um, um, pesticide on, on, on the input. But they will not do that, okay? And because, um, because of the risk. And here with, um, with, this, uh, with this specific farm association, okay, they, they were actually able to work with traders, with private partners to get rid of the credit constraint because they could have access to fertilizers Okay, and pay back when they sell the harvest. Okay, next. Okay. So, and when, when we did that, they said, okay, um, uh, can the uh, rainfall index insurance help? Okay. Can, can farmer buy, um, buy, um, um, buy an insurance? Okay, will it be based on, 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 on the district or on the village? Okay, they buy it upfront and they could invest, 
And when there is a sudden um, drop in rainfall, okay, they will collect a payment from, from the insurance company. Okay. And uh, actually, the, uh, the Farmer Association pointed into that as one of the priorities. Okay. And when, 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 um, when you start uh, discussing about this type of policies, okay, and you put them into perspective of, um, with what the government is doing. Okay, the government is subsidizing um, uh, um, fertilizers and seeds, but most of these um, most of these farmers, some of these farmers, go, um, um, do not necessarily need the subsidies. They said, okay, the main constraint, okay, uh, one of our main constraint, why we don't use enough. Um, enough certified seed, um, enough fertilizer, is because you are afraid of what will come, uh, um, what, um, what, um, uh, how much we'll harvest uh, if it turned out to be a bad rainfall year. Okay. So we start talking about how to help them design, to, to, to work with them, to design and test and experiment uh, some micro insurance, some crop micro, um, um, uh, some micro, uh, crop micro insurance mechanism, and the surprise, and, and the surprise, at least for me, was that uh, this was not a new idea to them, okay? because um, um, in the early 70s, okay, um, um, some um, some farmers was um, was part of an association which tried uh, um, a micro insurance schemes where they could ensure. Uh, um, um, the animal, it was mostly donkeys and oxen, okay? Uh, but, uh, but they could buy um, um, the insurance for their members. So, and at least from, from, from an agricultural perspective, this is, this is, a good, um, this is some, um, some good news that farmers are willing to try uh, um, some new ways uh, to protect uh, the, the main source of income, which is here, uh, uh, is farming. Okay, thank you. Vijay, would you like to come up and see? So let me just offer a few comments here to, to guide some of our thinking in your responses. One of the things that comes to mind listening to these various papers is what are we measuring? What is this thing we call Africa that we're measuring? And I think that Julius uh, points out that this changes over time. What is the thing that we're measuring and by what means? Whether it's agriculture, agrarian economy, whether it's other kinds of things that are less measurable. For example, Pliny the Elder is talking about Africa, Ifriqiya, Tunisia. That's Roman Africa. Uh, who is Homer talking about? He's talking about the, the Nile Delta, essentially. Later on, we're talking about different parts of Africa and measuring it in positive and negative ways. I think it's very helpful to know that we're looking at different features of this place that we're all here calling Africa. It strikes me that we're looking at small level farm economies, talking to farmers directly. We're looking at larger macro level issues. When you look at the large scale and the way it was put to us so passionately by Vijay, this is another way of perceiving what the numbers mean. An, econom an, an economist and measuring entrepreneurship is something that we, we need to do and be very careful about how we look at things over time and what that means for the future. One of the, the, the I guess the last point I'll make here that st strikes me as interesting here is the usual kinds of measures we would look at national GDP, we would look at uh, particular sectors, service sector, where do mobile phones fit? Is service sector, manufacturing sector, agricultural sector. Africa's leading edge, it strikes me from what I've heard today, may well be some new thing. I mean, farmers getting prices for mobile phones that they've been banking with, is that a finance sector? Is that a agricultural capital formation sector? How do people understand themselves their role in this new economy? And clearly, African farmers, African entrepreneurs, we see them operating on new kinds of fronts, innovating in ways that we need somehow to measure. And I'm not sure we really know how to do that completely yet. So I want to invite your comments, and let's take a few comments and then come back to the panel and ask them to, to respond. Derek. Um, 
My name is Derek Moina from here at BU, and I come from Zambia. And I have a question specifically for Professor Macmillan, and, but the other members of the panel could also uh, contribute to this. Now, you cited in one of the uh, research papers from your colleagues that agricultural outputs in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, have grown considerably over the past decades. I have a couple of questions to that. Um, my first question is, what are, what are the factors beyond, besides um, lowered taxation that has led to this um, increase in, 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 in agricultural outputs? And what kind of crops have seen that increase? And are these for export or for internal consumption? And added to that, um, has this translated into Africans having more nutritious food on their tables? And the last one is, what is the role of multinational agro corporations in this growth? And I'm thinking here, for example, Monsanto and others. Um, have they played a part in this increase? And if they have, what kind of role have they played? Thank you. Should we take a couple and then come back? Yeah. You think? Yeah. Okay. Okay, is that, was that Nathan? Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for the panel. My name is Justin Tinsey. I'm a global development policy student here at BU. Um, I just have macro questions about what we can attribute the recent growth trend to. The Chinese claim that they're responsible for at least 20% of the recent growth, and I was just wondering if any of the panelists could speak to that if they agree or refute that claim. And secondly, to what extent can be attributed to regional integration attempts? To what extent can regional bodies say that they're responsible for recent growth trends or will be in the future? Thanks. Okay, let's take, we'll take one more, Baru, and then we'll go to the panel. Okay, Baru Zodeh from Ethiopia. Uh, I would like to just make a few comments on Professor Mahajan's uh, exuberant celebration of entrepreneurship. Uh, I think there are some sobering thoughts that we should probably also share. Uh, just as we celebrate the achievements, we have to note the challenges that entrepreneurs face in Ethiopia uh, and Africa. Uh, my, my, my perspective is going to be obviously Ethiopian. Uh, so I mean, there are times when there are real entrepreneurs in Ethiopia, and those who really made it the hard way. But the, there are now, there is a phenomenon of the instant millionaire. Uh, I don't know about uh, whether it, happens, it appears in other countries as well, but in Ethiopia, we have what we could call instant millionaires, you know, who achieve uh, considerable wealth through political patronage uh, and party support and this kind of thing. So there are very enormous difficulties, you know. I mean, in the old days, we had uh, people like Bak who, who who built a string of hotels uh, along the Rift Valley through, through toil and labor, you know. But nowadays, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not so easy, you know, it's not so easy. Uh, and most of the time, I think uh, it's really some people that you don't even recognize who actually achieve uh, considerable wealth in a short period of time. You can see it also in the, in the, in the pattern of consumption. In the old days, you know, the old millionaires, all entrepreneurs, they were very, very fastidious about, about how they use their money because they knew uh, how difficult it was to, to make the money, but nowadays, uh, you, have, you have people who, who really spend it, you know, who, who buy cars like Hammer and, uh, um, you know, uh, I mean, it's really obscene, the, the things that you see on the streets of Addis Ababa sometimes. Uh, uh, so this, these are challenges. I think we have to be very careful not to overdraw the, the achievements. Thanks. Okay, why don't we have respo responses? I think we have Margaret and Vijay for the, for, for the last one. Okay, so you're from Zambia, but I forget your name, sorry. Derek? De Derek. Derek. Yes, Derek. Um, so what's responsible for the increases in productivity growth? Well, I don't know exactly, but um, do you remember um, the case of Malawi? They were in, the, I, I don't know where you live, but the, there was a big uh, article in the New York Times about the Malawian government how they challenged the World Bank. So the World Bank, you know, with their structural adjustment programs, got rid of all this subsidized fertilizer, blah, 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 blah. And the Malawian government said, to hell with the World Bank. We don't care if we get their money. We're going to let the farmers use fertilizer. They Farmers use fertilizer and output. Free, and free seeds. And, and, and free seeds and output. Shut up. Shut up tremendously. I don't know exactly what the situation is in Malawi today, but so I, I don't think that it's companies like Monsanto that are responsible for the recent 
increases in productivity growth that we've seen. I think it's more just making available s some of the old technologies that have been around. Um, um, the other thing, uh, export or, or, or domestic crops, <coughs> I mean, both things are increasing and productivity in both sectors are increasing. There, um, um, the issue is, I know, I know the case of Kenya better, where, um, so they export a lot of green beans to um, Europe, and I know that's been increasing a lot in Kenya, so that, that sector is growing, but um, there, um, it, the issue is smallholders are getting pushed out, so it's the larger corporations and uh, multinationals probably are playing a role in that growth, but they've been there for a long time. It's not like it's something new. What's new is the restrictions that the European Union has placed on the, you know, the, the sanitary restrictions on the commodities coming from Europe. And then has there been, has this led to more nutritious food on the table for Africans? That's a hard question to answer, but if you believe the results from the macroeconomists like uh, Salih Martin, if poverty really has gone down, then I, 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 my guess is that yes, it has led to more nutritious food on the table for Africans. And then the other question about, um, uh, I forget where it came from, but China, China uh, um, oh yeah, I believe that, I believe that if the Chinese say that 20% of the increased growth in Africa has come from China, I believe it. I, I don't know what the exact time period is, but the, the, the magnitude and breadth of the investments of the Chinese in Africa over the past 10 to 15 years is, is amazing. So I, would, I don't know the exact number, but I wouldn't be surprised if that were true. And as far as inter regional integration, I don't see much regional integration. There's a new paper by Caroline Freund at the World, she's in the research department, uh, trade research department at the World Bank. And she, she documents the e extraordinarily high transportation costs between countries and even within countries that inhibits, you know, regional integration. So I, I don't think that regional integration has had much to do with success. Okay, and there was a question about entrepreneurship for Vijay. Okay. Uh, Would you prefer to step out? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah what the hell? Okay, give me the microphone, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be kidding myself if I tell you that like any other developing country, Africa does not have any problem. And don't kid yourself. But that's the beauty of the entrepreneurship. Even in the hardest time, they find out how to make things work. Let me give you an example. Is anybody here from the Zimbabwe? Who's from Zimbabwe? I couldn't have gone in the worst time to Zimbabwe. There were only three, four flights coming there every day. I got out, the whole airport was totally shut down. There were taxi standings. Half of them did not have, have any gasoline. All the gas stations were shut down. But Mercedes dealership, their lights were on. Literally, and if you see my book, you'll see that. Why? Because all the embassies were still open, and all the NGOs were there, and they all have to take their cars someplace, and they love to drive Mercedes-Benz. It's a very complicated situation, okay? I mean, you go to Rwanda, and guess who has rented the most expensive houses in Kigali? NGOs. NGOs. I'm not, def I'm not demeaning them, for heaven's sake. My daughter is one of them. She wants to save the planet, but on my payroll. <laughs> okay, so, you know, that's a different story. And they, who said that uh, entrepreneurship is not very hard, but they make it happen? Name me two countries in the world, number one and number two, they are more likely to corrupt people to get their business done anywhere in the world. Number one, China. Number two, yeah. India. If don't, don't blame me, go Google it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, don't kid yourself. A bureaucrat cannot become an entrepreneur. A university professor cannot become an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is somebody very different, like my father. This is the guy who would even climb the mountains to sell fa fabric 
so he could give education to 10 of us plus pay for our marriage. So the entrepreneur, and at the same time, the beauty of the entrepreneur state is like the Indian state, government has nothing to do with the India. These guys figured out how to bypass the, uh, the government and send all the data through the lines, the telephone lines. And government said, what the hell happened here? And then they gave the credit to, uh, they gave the, credit to the uh, government. They stand up, he said, only because of you, we've been successful, and all these ministers are bragging about, oh, we have created an IT industry. Damn it, they had nothing to do with it. And the last the situation they had between India and Pakistan, I mean, I was the dean of the Indian School of Business. They all showed up in, the, the, in New Delhi. He said, you better shut up and bring your forces back from the border because we're going to lose our business, and we have created a $40 billion industry, and we have hired the brightest and the best in India. Guess what? Within three days, they withdrew all the forces from the border. Ladies and gentlemen, that's entrepreneur. That's entrepreneurship. And what China and India has done is they had unleashed their entrepreneurship. Somebody was saying that, I think you mentioned that you found this China in the small towns. Guess what? I saw them even a week before Ramadan in Cairo, cannot speak Arabic, they're carrying a knapsack, and they're going from door to door, and they're negotiating on the calculator. She said, no five, no 10, no, and they don't even speak Arabic. I saw them in Kigali. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there is something about entrepreneurship, and maybe where is Adele? You want to solve the world problem? Next time, have your conference on the entrepreneurship and how they're solving the problem. Celebrate them. And give the credit to the government. Hell with these guys. <laughs> oh, sorry. Very much for questions. Falu, Mark, and okay. one, two, three. Thank you. I want to, I want to uh, ask a question on a slightly different uh, level. And all the stakeholder, the Arab world, that is also investing in Africa. And uh, if you look at Senegal, you have now some uh, new Arab businessmen and Arab companies coming in. And uh, we also know that there, is a, uh, there are numerous similarities between colonization, the if effects of colonization, but also and the effects of uh, uh, Arabization of some parts of Africa. So as we look at the future of Africa, what kind of uh, predictions or assessment that Africans need to have? Uh, because we talk a lot about assessing our relationship with the West, but we do less so in terms of assessing uh, the patterns that are either negative or positive as Africa moves forward. So I would love to hear anything, any thought you may have as Africa emerges uh, to face the realities of the 21st century. Okay, we're going to have three questions, your response, and then we're going to, to, to go to lunch. So we have now Mark, and then our, well, that's fine, our colleague from Sierra Leone. Yes, yes uh, it's a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, experiences I've had in Africa, I worked all over Africa for UNESCO, and also in the universities, and one thing we tried to do was to find out why America developed very fast to the level America has been. And why immediately after the Second World War, the Japanese, the Chinese, and so on came over here. The thing that came out in our research was that education was the key. And we were so pleased. In Tanzania, when Julius Nerere started the, the literacy program, all other things, agriculture, whatever, they were linked to it because he believed in Uyama that for you to develop, you have to be literate in your own language. That's Swahili. Now, a lot of people, they started blaming him. They said, oh, yo, what will happen to our children if at all they leave Tanzania to get over to Europe to study? And there are a lot of reports that have been written against a good project like that. And several other places all over the world, all over Africa, who were thinking that by, looking, by using the local languages at the college, primary school level, with the literate people to open their bank accounts and so on, they should be literate. 
Nigeria, they started with the Hausa, the Igbo. Nigeria has over 500 languages, but they were able to use more than 20. My country, we have like 12 languages. We used all. But what has happened? They were a threat to the global entrepreneurial who want to exploit. They had to exploit through English or through French. But there's nothing wrong with that. The most important thing is really get your people literate. Education is the key, is the foundation to development. Agricultural programs, uh, credit programs, they will only work if your people are educated to the point of understanding it and doing it. Okay, thank you. Next question, Mark. Yeah, thank you. I just thought with um, uh, reference to this very upbeat assessment of uh, Africa's economy generally uh, from the panel, I just thought, wanted to get your insight on uh, economic inequality. Some of the most unequal uh, nations in the world are in Africa. In a recent UN study, I know Namibia was number one and Sierra Leone was number two. Sierra Leone's been uh, at the top or near the top among other countries for a very long time. And even when there is economic growth, uh, I want to give an example of, uh, of Rwanda, which has had a, you know, a boom in growth. Um, even the government came out and, and, and expressed alarm about the growth uh, of, of inequality. And in that country, um, that is something that, um, curiously, as opposed to being concerned about it in a place so densely populated, um, there has been, uh, apparently, for I've, I've been understanding from officials, that it's something that um, people are not supposed to talk about much in public. So you have a situation where the growth is happening, but so it appears inequality is, is at least staying where it is, or in some situations it's increasing. So I just wanted to invite your thoughts on that. Thank you. Let me ask maybe to work backwards from the questions. The inequality qu question seems to be pretty important as we move forward and think about these economic changes. So any of you who would like to address that issue? Inequality? Yes. Um, does any, I, I, have, I definitely have something to say. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's interesting. I, so I, I told you, I basically gave you what the authors are saying, but I didn't say I agree with what they're saying. <laughs> um, so that paper by Salim Martin, the crazy guy who holds office hours at midnight, his point three is the growth spurt that began in 1995 decreased African income inequality instead of increasing it. I, 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 I don't know, but, my, but actually, let me just tell you. So I, I just took a new job as division director of development policy at, at the International Food Policy Research Institute, and the first job on my agenda is to evaluate these papers and I'm a little surprised by the results on inequality because everything else that I've seen uh, on inequality it, it says that any within country inequality has been growing everywhere everywhere I mean in the United States in Brazil so so in China in India it's 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 a problem that's at the at the top of you know everybody's list of problems so um, I'm not surprised to hear what you say, and, and I, I've been doing some work on Botswana, and um, I have household data from Botswana that shows that between 93 and 2000, 2003, both poverty and inequality increased in Botswana. So I'm a little skeptical of the positive, um, all the positive results on inequality. Okay, another re response there, and then add something on education, and we'll wind up for the morning session. Okay, so, so <coughs> we, uh, um, yes, the, the, the main question on, on, um, on inequality is that we, wh well, I think we have to be careful, especially when we, are, uh, we start addressing inequality in, um, in, in countries who are moving out of poverty. Because so far, the, the main focus is, 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 is trying to lift the maximum of people above the poverty line, okay? So, um, and some time uh, doing that will, um, will, um, will, um, will require some trade-off, okay? So if, uh, w well, how much um, increase uh, in inequality are we willing to take up to move 30% uh, 
of, of, of the poor people above the poverty line? Or do we prefer, um, will, um, will you ever trade, um, trade that for a situation where the income stays relatively stable or uh, inequality stay the same, but we are only able to move 5% of the people um, above the poverty line? So um, inequality is there, but I think it's, um, it's, it's most of the time it's not, um, um, it's not a clear, there is no a clear cut answer, at least from, um, from, an, um, uh, uh, from an economic perspective. Um, we'll, um, we'll have to make some trade off as, we, as this economy starts growing. I just wanted to address the, um, the, 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 the question about how can Africa prepare itself for the 21st century. And it's related to the education issue. So, uh, uh, education is important. I was shocked to read in a paper recently that only half of all the kids that graduate from eighth grade in Ghana get to go on for further education because Ghana is known as the country in Africa that is best educated. So I totally agree with that. But um, I, I would hate for entrepreneurship to be oversold because um, how can Africa prepare itself for the 21st century? Yeah, answer Ch that, please. China. China put enormous restrictions on foreign direct investment into China. It wasn't entrepreneurs in China that did that. They put restrictions that ensured that the Chinese entrepreneurs would benefit from the foreign direct investment. African governments need to do the same thing, and they're not. So it's in, it's in the hands of the African governments. Oh, give it a hand, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Julius will have our, our okay. concluding comment. No, Vijay, oh, oh, respond for me and then Julius. Uh, actually, to me, all these three questions are related. Uh, first thing you have to realize there is that one third of the Muslim population in the world lives in Africa. And one third of Africa population is that of Islamic heritage. So the connection with the Arab country is very natural. Uh, because they belong. In fact, there are eight countries from, uh, nine countries from Africa which are part of the uh, uh, Arab Union and some of the largest ones. So that doesn't surprise me. And you can also see that uh, uh, they also need to put their money someplace and that money is coming into Africa and s s sometimes good places, sometimes bad places. Like somebody had a rather questionable agriculture in the Middle East and Sudan and it's true actually that that's the Arab money. Uh, uh, but at the same time, they're also spending that on good things. If you go to North Africa, you will see a lot of the education, the universities that are actually being developed through the Arab countries. Edu uh, the growth that somebody mentioned, uh, that's, the, that's the key word these, day, they, they, these days, is inclusive growth. Inclusive growth there is that everybody has to participate. For the last two years, Prime Minister of India, for example, had made a strong pitch uh, that you have a whole bunch of billionaires, but you also have poor people to get the inclusive growth. In Africa, somebody mentioned about Rwanda. Inclusive growth is again coming because of the, 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 the entrepreneurship. Let me give you an example. Uh, Nakomat, the largest the chain, the food chain, uh, supermarket chain from uh, Kenya, has first opened their first 24-hour supermarket in Kigali. Mm -hmm. So in order to open that, they had to really s s start a supply chain. And the supply chain, where are you going to get fresh fruit? Where are you going to get your <coughs> eggs? So they went back and started working with the farmers, the poultry farms, and taught them how to actually raise the chickens taught them actually how to d develop better uh, tomatoes because they cannot import those. So with that, they started part of, that edu the, part of the, the, the inclusive growth. Now education, if you read my book, that's a major concern for Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I was shocked for two reasons. First, Africa is the youngest continent. Average age, do you know what is average age in Africa? Huh? Who said 15? Okay, average age is close to 14.5, 15. It's the youngest continent, whatever the, the question may be. As a matter of fact, the, when you look at the Africa, uh, the, let, let's take Kenya. Kenya, for example, when they got their freedom from the British, the country was hardly about 15 million people. Right now, it's about 45. So there are 30, 30 million people in, uh, in Kenya who are less than 45 years old. So that dealing with a young population is going to be a huge issue for all the developing countries. India was 300 million in 1948. Now it's a billion. There are 700 million people in India who are less than 60 years old. So it's not the coincidence that the half of the country is less than 35 years old. Education is a key issue. That's why I'm so disappointed, so disappointed about the Arab Union that how the hell they went to China and started a business school 
when they had no connection with China, and up to this day, they still have not started one good business school on the whole continent. How can the businesses grow if they cannot find the good talent? And guess who opened the first damn good business school in uh, Africa? Chinese. <laughs> in Ghana, helped with the European Union. In Ghana? This, that's opened by the Chinese. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Julius, yeah. Okay, yeah. you have our closing uh, remarks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, about uh, about how Africa should be. Somebody mentioned about uh, the, the whole idea of restructuring relationships, and I, and I think yes, Africa has to start thinking. And I and I think Africa is still is thinking beyond Europe now. Uh, the the the, the, the so-called invasion of China. Uh, it's uh, and you you have also Brazil and other people coming in, but I think Africa has also to develop an attitude where we 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 have to move from a mindset of thinking exploitation. When we see people, we see business. The world that comes next is exploitation, neocolonialism. We also have to have the confidence that we can, we can learn, and we have been learning. Yeah, the Chinese will come, they will maybe exploit us in the short run, but why do we not believe that we, we will learn something from, from that in finally and be able to, to compete in the future? Yes, yeah, the we saw it in Kenya. For example, if we talk of Kenya, the, the, there were Indians who came, who were brought by the British, and they were the better business people. But over time, Kenyan people have learned, and now they are competing. The close business is no longer run by Indians, it's run by Africans. But the only way, reason why mm -hmm. Kenya are better business people was well, because these people were there. They let the Chinese come and trade, because it's like a race. When you're when you running a, a race, you always have a rabbit who is ahead <laughs> and pulls ahead. It's these foreigners, these people who come and start showing you new ways to do things. They beat you initially, but with time, we have to have confidence that we can learn, and I think we can, and we have shown the examples of learning. So I, I think it's, it's good, let them come. <laughs> Thank you to our panel. <laughs>